start up with Basil and configure it with Basil, and then you can uh, test it with its own built-in Inception model and Inception client. And then from there, you can go on to customize it with your own models. So I'm actually going to show a demo here. I've got on the right side, this is my log for TensorFlow serving. And then on my left side, this is an image where I have TensorFlow serving already compiled and built with Basil. So you can see here it's in uh, Basil bin, and then TensorFlow serving, and the model server. And I pre-saved the inception model that was trained on ImageNet from within TensorFlow serving. So I'm going to load that, which I've saved at inception output. And then I'm going to send the logs to this location here, Eris log which is what's being displayed on the right. So if I run this, you can see as the server sets up, the important lines are at the bottom, where it tells you that the server is running. So here it's running at uh, 0000, so open to anything, and on port 9000. So now I downloaded a couple sample images. Here I've got some hamburgers, and here I've got a kangaroo. So if I check, you can see the images are saved here. I'll now call the uh, client that I've also configured, or that also came pre-built with TensorFlow serving when I ran Basil over it. And I'll get the output of my Inception uh, image net model. So it says that that kangaroo is probably a wallaby brush kangaroo, <coughs> and you can see the scores here. So that's the highest one. So now I'll do the same with the hamburger. And it infers, and it tells me this is probably a cheeseburger. So quite a bit higher than the number two of meat loads. So with that done, we can see the server works. But how did I do this? Because TensorFlow Serving, by default, will only work on uh, Linux. It doesn't work on Mac OS, or it doesn't work on Windows. So what I actually used was I used Docker here. So if I can get a show of hands of who here knows what Docker is. Uh, great. Who here has used it before at work or on personal projects? OK, so still quite a few of you. Great. So we're actually going to use that, too, for TensorFlow Serving. Because I found in my own personal experience, Basil is great, but it's like a, uh, maybe your really pretty girlfriend or boyfriend who's a bit high maintenance. So, <laughs> Basil often gives me problems when I try to use it directly. So we're going to use it inside a Docker image that TensorFlow has provided, which is actually how I ran those demos. So maybe, Bas maybe you can imagine a Docker here as being a cleaning lady that keeps your apartment clean so you don't get complaints. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so they include the Docker file that allows us to build the, uh, the server and build the client. So what the Docker file does is it basically defines the infrastructure. So it tells Docker how to create this virtual image that holds all of the dependencies and all of the things that TensorFlow and TensorFlow Serving depends on. It doesn't actually contain the pre-built uh, TensorFlow Serving itself and you still need to use Basil, but you can be pretty sure it's gonna work because they're telling you what the infrastructure, and they've tested it ahead of time. So I've actually got this sort of text dump here that I'll, this is the Docker file that defines the infrastructure that our server is running in. So we can see in this column here, this is basically telling us what to install with the app to get. So the important things include Python dev, OpenJDK, things like that. Then we're running here, we're getting pip, we're installing these in pip for Python, so NumPy, SciPy, Jupyter, Pandas, and then we're copying some of that over. This is the uh, high maintenance stuff related to Basil, and then over here we're downloading uh, from the Git server, and then sort of pre-running some of these build tools. And then at the end, the image will just give us a, uh, a command line of bash. So that command line there, this bit, command bin bash, is the same thing I'm getting here when I call this. So 
just to summarize a bit about Docker for the people who aren't so familiar with it, what that Docker file does is we run that with the Docker build command, and that creates an image. And what that image does is it's basically the build infrastructure virtualized, sort of a static environment that has everything defined, all of the pip installs, all of the uh, app get, all of the Bazel setup, all of that. And then when you build that image, that's static, and then you have to run the image with Docker run. This is actually a mistake on the second line. I should say Docker run instead of Docker build. And running the image gives you a container. So a container is the live thing that has lots of mutable data that you can then, after changing or compiling TensorFlow serving, save to a new image. So in your Docker file, you can define environment-related stuff, such as uh, environment variables or software to pre-configure with. And in the container itself, when you run the image, what you define is things like if you want to map a local folder to your uh, container, and that folder can hold all of your model files that TensorFlow Serving is going to read from. So the downside to using these is that it, because it needs to be, uh, the idea of Docker is that it's virtual and you can move it anywhere, it doesn't give you access to the hardware stuff. Like uh, if you want to do a lot of inference and training, that would be the GPUs. So NVIDIA, who most of you probably train on anyway, <coughs> have their own separate Docker called NVIDIA Docker that does provide an interface to access special hardware from them. So back to TensorFlow Serving, in terms of your model, what you want to do, if you have it, you probably have maybe uh, you've frozen it as a lone protobuf file, or you have it saved as a list of checkpoints. So what uh, TensorFlow provides is a mechanism for saving the model called the uh, Saved Model Builder. And with that, you basically have a signature definition that defines what layers map to the signature you want in your server to do inference, such as the input of uh, maybe a JPEG image, and then the output of something else, maybe your output layer, or your scores, or predictions, things like that. So this uh, default signature map that I mentioned at the bottom is important. So I'm gonna be talking about that here. So what you can see in the top right is a block of code I had where I defined one of the signatures. So these are all important. There are uh, a lot of defaults that are available, such as I imported from TensorFlow this uh, TF save model signature constant, and then there's a default for the classify name, the output, the input, things like that. And then there's similar constants for predictions or for uh, different methods that you might want to call. So then, in the model signature itself, you can define the inputs and the outputs, and then in some cases you can also define a third one where it's the method. Ah, oh, that's here. <coughs> so these are what your client is going to call and what you have to include in the client to get to the right uh, predictions back. So you can also add your own custom ones that uh, have unique names that then you would have to make special modifications on your client to use. So there's a good reference page here. It was actually the documentations on GitHub, not on the main websites. So the other thing that uh, TensorFlow is really beneficial is for doing testing, like EV testing, or upgrading models in place. So if you have, say, a couple models, here I've got PoopNet and I've got Skynet, and uh, so I've got two models, and I've got different versions of them. And what you can do intelligently with TensorFlow is it converts this format as important. It looks at the folder names and infers the version number from the number of the folder. So it has to be in this exact folder with model version, and then your saved model file, and your weights inside a variables folder. So if you don't have this, it won't work properly. But uh, Within this, when the client makes a request to TensorFlow, you can say specifically, use version 1, use version 8, or whichever one you know, if you've changed not just the accuracy of the model, but the way it works, and what the inputs are, you can then have multiple models of the same type living side by side, and both being able to be served from the same server. So this makes it easier because if you add a model, the, you don't need to restart the server, it'll automatically pick it up. So in 
order to enable the configuration, what you have to do is when you run the server, you give it this model config list, which defines what the name is. So this is what the client uses to request it. What the base path is, this is where the uh, version number folders are, and then the platform, which is always pretty much going to be TensorFlow. The downside of uh, using multiple models in the same server is to get this new config file in. You do have to restart the server. So that's not ideal. So at least here at Bookpad, the work that I've done here has mainly been in Keras, not in pure TensorFlow. So how do you export a Keras model into a format that can be read by TensorFlow Servant? You have to basically import the Keras backend and then you have to manually define some of those same signatures. So what I'm doing here is I'm defining the model version. I'm loading the model. Keras makes it really easy where you just call models load model. And you can see I got models from Keras import models. And then this instantiates my model that I can then access the weights of, or the layers, sorry, not the weights, the layers, just by here with dot input and dot output. And then I can then map those to get the tensor info and then define those as being the inputs and the outputs and map the output layers specific to these uh, TensorFlow serving defaults. So these signature constants I got from here. TensorFlow save model signature dash utils. Or sorry, here. Utils signature constants. So what are the drawbacks to this? I should mention the way that we used to do uh, things here, or the way we still do things here internally at least, in that I've been trying to convert <coughs> TensorFlow serving against, is, so it's for the second bullet point, that uh, we built a web server that you would just send an image to, like you would normally upload an image on the web. And that works almost anywhere, so without the protobuf format. So, because TensorFlow Serving will only accept the protobuf format, what you can do if you want to use both, or if you want to still have access to these old formats with the uh, TensorFlow Serving method, is you can sort of run an intermediate gateway that will convert like a standard image from whatever format, maybe it's a binary file, maybe it's a 6 64 that will encode it to the protobuf and pass off to TensorFlow Serving. The other thing that took me a little while to realize was how long, or how a lot of the documentation that uh, wasn't produced by Google is out of date due to the way I believe it was earlier this year with TensorFlow 1.0, when they changed the way that you sort of save and uh, serialize a TensorFlow model. So the new API, the one that's just called <coughs> Save Model Builder, is uh, incompatible with uh, or sorry, the old formats that you use before Save Model Builder is incompatible with the newest TensorFlow Servant. So any old guides won't be very helpful to you. So sort of to conclude my experiences with TensorFlow Servant was it was simple and that it was out of the box. You don't have to write a ton of code to get it going compared to running your own web server in like Bottle or Boto. And uh, you can get it set up easily in Docker, like the Docker images that I showed before, they had some time spent uh, building it with Basil, but uh, in terms of actual work, it might take 10 or 15 minutes to get your server up and running. Uh, the benefits here with TensorFlow Serving is that it does handle easily multiple models and multiple versions that can coexist at the same time, which is really nice. And uh, I would encourage anyone who's interested to give it a shot based on how simple it is. In terms of our experiences here, we found that, or I found personally, that uh, a lot of the benefits of TensorFlow serving, such as the large scale, weren't too uh, useful, at least internally, as uh, when Google released TensorFlow serving on their own blog post, they mentioned that they were using it for about 100,000 inference requests every second. So I don't know what the scale of uh, the machine learning is at the companies that you guys work with, but uh, we're not quite with it. <laughs> so I want to make big thanks to, uh, especially to the people at Google for making this, and to Stack Overflow and GitHub, who were able to help me find so many of the problems I ran into trying to convert my own models and run my own server. 
especially surrounding things that aren't machine learning related, such as our own procedure calls and protobuf files. So I want to thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. some like comment or you know idea about the performance of one instance of like TensorFlow or like it's uh, not fair to compare to a Google product right so they have some <laughs> yeah uh, so the way I was doing it was actually all through Docker so it was all over CPU okay. and uh, yeah I felt that it was faster than uh, the equivalent Python model the way that we had our server set up before was there would be like uh, maybe 10 different models running with our Python thing. And uh, that was tricky because then with every request, you would have to reload the model. Mm -hmm. So the benefit here is that it sort of keeps all of them sort of uh, not in use, but all live enough that a new request won't reload a new model. That's, so there's some caching, you mean, mm -hmm. directly? Yeah, it, uh, yeah, when you even upgrade a model, it sort of keeps the previous one available, but it sets the new one as the default. Okay. So it doesn't really load the new one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. I have certainly learned a lot, and I think everybody learned a lot. And we can have more questions after the next talk, when there's more networking time. But now we have to proceed to the next talk. Uh, which is Wuka 